What's cracking? Big dogs. Whew. Feels good to be back on the microphone. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Welcome back to the headquarters. Welcome back to the channel. I feel like I haven't filmed a video in like 45 years. I'm not sure why that's the case, considering I put out a video like every fucking day. But when I have that feeling, I get the itch and we hit record. Today is a, uh, a polarizing topic. One of my favorite topics in, in fantasy, possibly one of my favorite topics to study just in the history of Earth. That's fat running backs. You know, most of you guys like to argue with me when I call a running back fat. I'm always right. That's the thing. If you're over like 217 pounds, you're fat. All right. But we love fat, fat running backs. Okay. That ain't a bad thing. Y'all have a problem with it because you have a negative connotivity to the word fat. I like the word fat. P-H-A-T, F-A-T. There's no other ways to spell fat, I guess. I like both of them though, equally. And we're talking about a fat running back today in our sophomore series, which is our Safi seconds. Okay. This is like week eight, maybe week nine of it, where we've been breaking down this sophomore class, which is dynamite, explosive in every sense of the word. And it's going to win fantasy football leagues this year. We've been going week by week, taking one running back, one wide receiver from this class and going in depth on them. Okay. We're drilling through the fat. We're like a fucking surgeon right now, both physically, spiritually, metaphorically, Zach Mossley. So that's what we're talking about today. We've got Zach Moss up on a platter for you and Michael Pittman. Those are the next groupings of sophomore wide receivers and running backs. If you've missed any of the previous, so anyone going off the board earlier than Zach Moss and Michael Pittman, according to Underdog ADP, we've already done a video on them, which will be linked below. You'll see historical Safi Seconds videos, and it'll be RB1, RB2, RB, whatever. All right, that's 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 what we got on tap today. So it is the continuation of our Safi Seconds series. This might be the last one of the series because I don't want to start talking about fucking A.J. Dillon and another fat running back. He can probably just fit into today's video, and I'll just say don't don't draft his ass and redraft this year, regardless of what happens to Aaron Rodgers. Today we're getting after it. Zach Moss, Michael Pittman. Let's tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. Let's eat. If at any time you're enjoying the video, you find it informational and you're like, oh, I kind of like this guy's style. He's fucking annoying as shit, but he gives out good fantasy advice. You could hit the button that looks like this as well as subscribe to the channel because we're doing videos like this every single day leading up to your draft while we're in season as well. OK, so subscribe, hit the thumbs up and let's talk about Mr. Zach Moss currently being picked 105th according to underdog ADP, which is paid money leagues this is legitimate adp 100 outside the top 100 running back 35 overall he was the bills third round pick last year finishes his rookie year 112 carries 481 yards on the ground four touchdowns 4.3 yards per carry not bad 18 targets 14 receptions 95 receiving yards and a tugger rb45 in fantasy plays in 13 games okay he only played on 45 percent of the bills snaps a lot of us had this this dream this vision, we were the MLKs of fantasy football talking about Zach Moss clearing the path to RB1 status, getting all this work, eating all these chicken legs, and getting the goal line carries. I had an opportunity share in this backfield of 43.3%. At the end of the day, a direct split, a direct competition with Devin Singletary. Despite lots of links, reports, rumors of them adding a big name back in free agency, me continuously saying they should add Chris Carson, uh, the NFL draft linking them to running backs in the first round. All they did was add basically a single ankle in the signing of Matt Breida. So again, it should be Zach Moss and it should be Devin Singletary in 2021. I think we'd all like to see Zach Moss take over. And I think it can happen. He never really got going last year in his rookie season. Thanks to a you know a turf toe injury or a toe injury that happened in week two. It cost him weeks three, four, and five. He suffered a high ankle sprain in the playoffs and had surgery this offseason. He'll be ready for everything. But injuries were definitely a part of uh, his rookie season. So when we look at what we should expect going forward, you know, you have the athletics, Joe Buscaglia saying running back Zach Moss could take over the backfield in 2021. If he continues to improve, he has underrated receiving skills. He's their best runner between the tackles, showing a punishing running style that routinely maximized attempts and is the bills preferred goal line back. I think we kind of uh, saw that last year at the end of that statement. We saw something uh, about offense could land Moss 70% of the team snaps last year. We kind of knew what we were getting out of Zach Moss, right? Like they actually told us 55 times throughout the NFL draft process. They see him as the bruiser. They see him as the goal line back, the bigger back. And that's kind of exactly what fucking happened. So this goes back to my point of saying when a coach or a staff or a running back group or whatever the fucking case may be, when we hear reports of people telling us what they're going to do in the backfield. We should probably believe them. We can't get mad 
when they tell us what they're going to do and then they fucking do it, i.e. Miles Sanders in, I believe, tomorrow's video. Here's the thing. Them throwing around something like, oh, he should get 70% of the snaps is just stupid. There were literally five running backs last year that had a 70% snap share. So while it's cute and it's fun to throw out buzzwords and buzz numbers and arbitrary fucking stat points in fantasy, you're tossing them around with literally no backing to it. He's not hitting 70% of the snaps because nobody hit 70% of the snaps. Only workhorse featured backs hit 70% of the snaps in their respective offenses. So when you hear that, don't believe it, and it doesn't fucking matter, okay? Problem number one. Problem number two is that Zach Moss had a very defined role in this Bills backfield. Moss was the bruiser, the goal line back. Singletary was the pass catcher. In 13 games, Moss played in, right? He played in 13 games. He had 11 goal line carries. Singletary had three goal line carries. Josh Allen had seven. So a lot of the time we have this idea that Josh Allen is stealing all of this, this goal line work, all these goal line carries. While he does, yes, it's not like he is the goal line back, okay? So in the 13 games that Moss played, he had 11 goal line carries. That's pretty fucking significant, especially for a rookie. That number's probably going to go up. And yes, Allen can still have seven, eight, nine, ten of them, and Zach Moss can still have a, a good amount and, and obviously lead the backfield and goal line carries. So even with Josh Allen having seven in those 13 games, Moss still had 11. That's, you know, a, a little bit less than one per game. And if you average that out to the 16, you're looking at 14, 15 goal line carries. That's going to be good enough for top six, top eight numbers in the NFL in terms of just raw goal line carries for the year. But in terms of targets, Moss had 18, 18, and that absolutely murders murders a ceiling for a fantasy running back. Singletary had 50, 50. So that wasn't even close. And that's my big concern. Again, because when you don't have targets, you don't have a ceiling. It's the reason why we have Derrick Henry in a tier behind C-Max and Dalvin Cooks. He can go for 2,000 rushing yards and still not really be close to them in fantasy points per game because he doesn't get the target. It's the reason why you have a lot of, you know, Nick Chubb falls behind a lot of the mid-range RB1s. He's a better runner, but he's not getting those passes, okay? And you could literally take his receiving production from last year, Zach Moss's, and times it by 100%, double it, and he's still at like 35 targets, 40, whatever, in a full 16. He doesn't offer breakaway plays either, which is the problem. I feel like in terms of a fantasy running back, you need one of those two things. You need the pass catching prowess, or at least getting the targets, the opportunities, the volume or breakaway plays, right? Where, okay, maybe I don't catch four or five passes a game, but if I bust off 25, 35 yard runs, that more than makes up for it. And he doesn't really have that. We look at a tweet uh, from Dwayne McFarland. Context matters. It's a great context on the Bills backfield from Joe. He was quote tweeting an article that someone from the Bills camp put out using the eight games referenced for Moss versus Singletary, both full strength. I dug into snap utilization. So Moss played in 13 games. Uh, Singletary was banged up. Moss was banged up. So I guess they took a sample size of the eight games in which they were both at full strength. Two minute offense. Here's how the snaps were divvied up. 21% to Moss, 79% to Singletary. Long down distance, 44% to Moss, 56% to Singletary. Inside the five-yard line, obviously that favored Moss heavily. Four-minute offense, this is where it's kind of interesting. I guess they weren't in hurry-up mode yet. 73% to Moss, 27% to Singletary. But as you could see how they switched between two minutes and four minutes, there's a very, very distinct role defined there. As soon as they got into two minutes, and they're like, we need to hurry up. We're not uh, we're not stopping between downs. Singletary, you got to be out, out there. And if that's not going to change going into next year, the three-down workhorse ability, the 70% snap range is just out of the range of, of questions. Because, listen, a high percentage of snaps happens in that in that two minutes, right? They're doing hurry up. So if you if you run 35 plays in the first half and five of them or 20% of them or whatever happen in the last two minutes, because that typically happens, right? You're running hurry ups. You might rattle off four, five, six, seven, eight, nine plays, eight, nine snaps in that two minute range. There goes a big percentage chunk split of the playing time. Now, it's not all bad, right? I'm saying don't get super high on the fake ceiling that Zach Moss has, but what could be underrated going into next year, what might lead to more playing time for Zach Moss, getting on third downs, one, his pass blocking, man. And I don't really get into pass blocking. I don't really give a fuck about it when it comes to fantasy football. It's not predictive. It doesn't tell us anything about it. But among 40 running backs last year with at least 35 pass blocking snaps, Moss ranked second in terms of pass blocking grade per PFF. Again, I don't think it's a huge reach pushing Moss into more of a pass catching role in uh, in 2021 because he was a good pass catcher in college. Yes, it was against shitty competition and he was the workhorse there, but he had two separate seasons of 28 or more catches. So if you're a good pass blocker and Singletary is a bad pass blocker, there's a reason to keep more in on third downs. OK, and Moss's Moss's position in our minds, at least as a pure runner. I think is very underrated coming off of last year because he doesn't provide those flashy plays because he does not have those breakaway runs that we like to see and get us excited. I think we think of him as kind of like a shitty runner that just takes what he's given. But when you look at the position he's in, right, first off, you look at the team, you look at the situation. Uh, they averaged 30 points per game last year, which was the third highest in the NFL. I don't think that's going anywhere with Josh Allen 
under center and them running the offense through Josh Allen and them being an up-tempo offense and passing a lot, they're going to continue to score a lot. And when you score a lot, when you're in a running back in an offense that scores a lot and you see 85% of the goal line snaps, you're going to see a lot of scoring opportunities. Okay. Going back to the goal line, the raw goal line carry numbers. That's just basic common sense for a high floor in fantasy football. Would anyone be surprised if he finished with nine to 10 rushing touchdowns this year? No. Is it likely? I don't know. Probably not, but it is certainly not out of the range of outcomes. They also have a above average offensive line, 15th in run blocking last year, sixth in pass blocking per PFF grade. They re-signed most of their free agents, John Feliciano, uh, Daryl Williams and use three to four draft picks on offensive line. So at the end of the day, it won't be a liability to them. And for Moss as a runner, when we're looking at efficiency, was he actually good as a running back? He ranked seventh in both juke rate and yards created per touch per player profiler. Okay, juke rate is just basic elusiveness when you had the ball in the hands, the yards created is, you know, the yards that you created based off your elusiveness on each touch. So he ranked top seven among all running backs in both of those categories. So there was nothing, nothing really fancy last year with Moss, but he did, but he did on the analytical level, bring his tackle breaking ability, which is what everybody fucking gave this undying hype to for him coming out of college, right? He was making so many dudes miss. He was that, he was that PFF guy that uh, they kept going on about and gave him the high grades because he made guys miss. And he did carry that over to the NFL level. People don't want to see that. Don't They don't want to admit it. Honestly, it was it was tough to see until you kind of dove into the numbers. But Moss is good. Moss is a good runner as a rookie. Uh, and where Moss is going outside of the top 100 picks is one of my favorite, my favorite picks this year at the running back position in all of fantasy football. I'm not expecting a top 12 finish from him outside of a Singletary injury. But if he overtakes the starter role and he converts better than three for 11 on the goal line, he could easily be a top 20 fantasy running back. And you're getting him at running back 35. OK, so I don't like to invest too much into floor running backs, but that's the case for when I'm in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round. He's going outside of the top 100 picks. OK, so we're not going to project him to go from 14 catches up to 50 catches or from 44 percent of the snaps up to 70 plus percent of the snaps. But there's absolutely room to grow because because again, he was better as a running back than people remember just in terms of making things on his own, creating on his own. The goal line opportunities are there. He converted on a very low percentage of them, which I expect to change because he was very good at that in college. And there's definitely room to grow on third downs. He was a good pass blocking running back and he proved in college that he could catch the ball. So it might not happen. They might not force him into that role, but there is room for that to grow. So I really, really like where Zach Moss is going off the board. Let's pivot. To something that's a little less clear. And I'm not talking about my Felix Gray glasses because these things are clear as fucking ever clear. And I don't suggest you children out there that are in my demographic to ever try ever clear. Maybe, maybe like a uh, senior week of your college year, you guys are, you know, making a toast and you're like, we want to forget everything about the real world that's about to happen to us. Let's drink a lot of ever clear. And then you will be clear as these Felix Gray glasses. These Felix Gray glasses are the single best purchase I've ever made under a hundred dollars. That is not hyperbole. I'm not being paid to say that. I'm literally being paid to say this paragraph, but all of this is straight from the heart. Okay. These things are blue light blocking glasses, which means if you have 55 screens in your face, which I do right now, I have the camera screen. I have my laptop screen. I have my big secondary monitor. I have my phone right there. I'm about to make a YouTube short afterwards where I'm staring at my, here's the thing. If you're looking at screens all day, which a lot of you guys are going back to your, your work offices, you're probably getting eye strain. Okay. By the end of the day, you're staring at your screens for eight to 10 hours. Your eyes begin to hurt, which means your sleep is going to start lacking. You're you're also going to start get bags and dark circles under your eyes. Here is how you combat that. Literally one purchase. These things will last you fucking forever, like five years. OK, probably more 10 years. I don't know how long blue light fucking shields against, but these things are doing pretty damn good. If you have bad sleep because you're staring at screens all day, if you're some if you're someone who looks at their phone before they fall asleep, you know, you're looking at your fucking Tinder swipes. You're looking at who's DMing you on Instagram. Listen, we've all been there and we're all still there. Then this is the perfect product for you. Okay. FelixGray.com. The link will be right in the description. These are called the, the hopper. Okay. A lot of people ask what style I'm wearing. These are called the hopper. If you want to look like a fucking nerd, you also look pretty smart in them. That's the thing. Anytime you wear glasses, your intelligence level, right? If you're a Madden player or something and they're doing your, your statistics or whatever, like my speed is probably like a 42. My awareness is at like 150 eyesight, smartness, intelligence would be very high right now. 65 right now, 95. 65, 95, 65. Okay. You look smart. You feel good. And you feel good. You play good. When you play good, you sleep good. FelixGray.com. Link will be down in the description below. Please get them for your own safety, your own health. Love you. Oh, they done messed up. Bringing the BDGE New York City live draft weekend back. We're ready to shut that city down. If COVID couldn't, 
We just might. Okay. I mean, seriously, we have such a great group of guys. I mean, all sharps, couple legends. Shout out to you, Lucas. Um, I, I'm just so honored and pumped to be back. I don't even know what I'm looking forward to most, to be honest. Is it the bottomless marks? Is it Nick kind of taking us under his wing and showing us the ropes to the Big Apple? Or is it just coming out and dominating the damn draft? I probably got to go with just a little bit of everything from the morning workout with Noah to the fire food we get to eat to the amazing, wild, crazy nightlife and all the memories we get to make in between with all the fellas. I mean, that, that's definitely got to be my favorite part. Uh, I got to give a special thanks, though, to Brett and Mike. Uh, thank you guys for holding on to that championship trophy for me, uh, keeping her warm while I've been away. But best believe she's coming home to daddy. Michael Pittman, Indianapolis Colts wide receiver, currently being picked outside of the top 100 as well. Wide receiver 48. Now, he was really early pick last year, right? Beginning of the second round. They took him earlier than Jonathan Taylor, right? They had two second round picks. They went Michael Pittman, then Jonathan Taylor. So it told you what they thought about him at the time. He went one pick after T. Higgins, right? The second round started and went T. Higgins, first wide receiver, first pick in the second round. Next pick, Michael Pittman at the 202 coming out of USC. Here is the baseline of Pittman's rookie year. Here's how I want to explain how I feel about Pittman. I want to I want to paint these strokes for you, Van Gogh style. If you are pegging Michael Pittman, if you're one of the zillion people pegging Michael Pittman as a breakout player in 2021, it is almost purely on projection, aka you want it to happen, all right? You're looking at his athleticism, you're looking at what he did in college, whatever it is, but we didn't see a lot of encouraging signs from Michael Pittman during his rookie year. And obviously every breakout, right? If you're projecting someone to be a breakout, that means they haven't broke out yet, which means everything about putting them as a breakout is projection, right? You're projecting that to happen. What I'm saying is that we don't have a lot to work off from that rookie year, okay? Like you could look at Jerry Judy, a guy that I'm projecting to break out in, in year two. But when you look at Judy, you have a lot of reasons to point to why you think he's going to break out, right? Almost 900 yards as a rookie, commanded over 100 targets, unbelievably high, uncatchable target rate, which you think would have to go up next year while being highly, highly successful in terms of uh, running routes and separation for Matt Harmon's reception perception. So we're obviously projecting hit, but we've also seen him be good on a football field at the NFL level, whereas Michael Pittman, we haven't seen that. So yes, you could like him from college, you could like his athleticism, you could like the situation, but we have not seen him. Number one thing to understand when you are projecting young players is one, are they good on a football field? Have they been good on the football field? All else doesn't matter. Athleticism doesn't mean a fucking thing if you can't play football. There's dudes walking down my block right now that are probably NFL level of athleticism. Couldn't fucking catch a ball if you threw it to them. It hit them straight in their fucking nose, okay? You can buy Felix glasses to cover up that nose if it's broken. Here's the thing. Michael Pittman had a lot, a lot of trouble staying on the field for the Colts as like a staple of this receiving group, despite it being absolutely like atrocious. We had uh, an absolute black hole of a receiver in T.Y. Hilton, who's going to be 32 years old this year. Here is his uh, reception perception charts, third percentile success rate versus man coverage. Uh, like he went downhill really, really quickly last year. They had Paris Campbell out for the year. The next guys up are like Zach Pascal and Marcus Johnson. And when you look at Michael Pittman's efficiency metrics, he didn't rank highly. I don't think he ranked highly in a single one of them. Like yards per reception, yards per target, yards per outrun. All of these things were were miserable, right? He, he, he didn't give you a lot of bright spots to actually get excited about. When you're looking at 2021, though, all that being said, all that being yelled about at your face, it's worth mentioning the excuses that a lot of you guys are already making for him as to why he's going to break out in 2021. When you look at the offense last year, I mean, they ran through their running backs. They ran it through their running backs, and they also passed through their running backs. The screen game was very evident. Like 30% of their targets went to running backs, highest rate in the NFL. And you could argue it's a chicken or the egg thing there. But listen, uh, outside of a vertical threat for, you know, if you are a vertical threat like Michael Pittman, it's an awful match to be matched with a guy like Philip Rivers, right? Philip Rivers in his fucking angel hair pasta arm at this point in his career has no, no business throwing the ball up to Michael Pittman, letting him make contested catches last year. When you look at Rivers' numbers, at a 39 qualified quarterbacks, Rivers ranked 30th in deep ball attempt rate. He, uh, he attempted a deep ball on less than 10% of his throws, which was 30th out of 39, okay? Carson Wentz, their new quarterback, ranked 6th, so taking a lot more deep shots last year. Philip Rivers ranked 18th in yards per attempt on deep balls. He also had a 5-5 five to five touchdown to interception ratio last year. If you look at the rest of the quarterbacks, there were only four that had a worse touchdown to interception ratio, meaning they were in the negative. That was Drew Locke, Teddy Bridgewater. Shout out to Denver. Mitch Trubisky and Dwayne Haskins. Not a favorable list 
to be on. Reason number two why Michael Pittman might be better this year, him not breaking out despite having a really shitty wide receiver group can be looked at as a positive, okay? Because because their wide receiver group stinks, he still very much has the opportunity to be the alpha and to be become the number one in Indy this year. Because you look around at the weapons that they have, right? Like I said, Hilton is is likely toast. And if he's not, he's going to be like a specialty player that you take a few, you pick and choose your spots that you want to take on Hilton down the field or whatever next year. And then you have Paris Campbell, right? The people that still believe Paris Campbell is going to be a thing probably have Josh Gordon rostered on their dynasty teams. They probably are, are the ones drafting uh, Odell Beckham. They're the ones keeping Odell Beckham in the sixth round of underdog drafts this year. Same guys, I think Paris Campbell is going to be like a big time player. Once you miss the first two years of your career, the chances of you actually breaking out or hitting on the NFL level are so fucking small, right? And outside of those guys, again, it's like Zach Pascal, Marcus Johnson. They The only thing they added was a seventh round rookie to their wide receiver group. And the big change here is obviously, as I mentioned before, Carson Wentz reuniting with Frank Reich. And Wentz was obviously awful last year, but now he'll actually have some some time to hang out behind his offensive line, and he won't be like a literal magnet to the defensive lineman coming back into the backfield, right? Those crashing linemen will not be stuck to him like they were in Philadelphia. It's a new environment. It's a fresh start. It's almost, to be honest, though, it's almost like the same example I use with Pittman to Jerry Judy is like if you're comparing Wentz to like Sam Darnold, right? I I consider those two comparisons kind of similar in the sense that like we want Michael Pittman to break out, but we haven't seen him do it on a football field. Jerry Judy, we've seen him do it on a football field. We're projecting him to break out. Sam Darnold switches to a new environment, but we've never actually seen him be good on a football field. Where Carson Wentz, we actually have, okay? So that's the good thing here. That's that's the reason why you would project a guy like Carson Wentz to give Michael Pittman the ceiling. Whereas people excited for like DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, because Sam Darnold's coming over, it's like that, that's that shouldn't be optimism. That should you should be able to be aware that it's more of the unknown that you're getting excited about and not putting that into a positive. Okay, so we have Carson Wentz coming over and we've seen him be good at football, which is what gives us hope. Uh, At the end of the day, though, Michael Pittman was a late breakout agent college, 38th percentile. So the red flag was obviously there. We're also projecting two things for this year to break out. We're we're one projecting or hoping that he's actually a good NFL wide receiver, which we have yet to see. Two, we're hoping that Wentz will be good again, which we have no idea if that's going to happen. If there were reasons for hope for Michael Pittman, again, I kind of named what they were in terms of opportunity, but in terms of what he did last year, his stats weren't there, right? He had, uh, he played in 13 games, 61 targets, 40 receptions, 503 receiving yards, one touchdown. He actually performed pretty well in reception perception, which I was surprised to see. 75th percentile success rate versus man coverage above the average in terms of press coverage too. zone. I'm not too worried about because that's really more predictive for slot wide receivers. And he also dealt with a a serious calf injury last year. Uh, So it was just a weird health year for him as a rookie. He ranked third amongst all wide receivers in terms of uh, yak. But I'm going to be honest with you, that's probably not correlated to being a good NFL wide receiver, nor a good fantasy wide receiver. If you look at the guys who ranked above him, it was Debo who literally led the NFL in terms of like the percentage of his targets that were screen plays. So obviously his yak number is going to be high. Second was McCall Hardman, who stinks. Uh, So I think it's much less like player based and and predictive for fantasy uh, and much more likely that it's like offense scheme, role, average depth of target, things like that when it comes to yak. So I'm not buying into it. So when I think of Pittman, like the reception perception definitely gets me a little bit more comfortable drafting him. I I definitely am not taking him above like Zach Moss. I'd much rather have Zach Moss on my team than than Michael Pittman. And there are probably some other guys behind him I'd rather have. I think if he gets in the single digits, I'm probably going to pull back on Michael Pittman and not going to be looking to draft him. Because at the end of the day, again, it's less optimism and more uncertainty that gets us excited for Michael Pittman. Had we seen him be really good on the on the field last year, like had we see him played in eight games and, you know, he, he averaged like 60 yards a game or something, and he put up 500 yards in eight games, then there's reason for optimism. You say, hey, he was really good, limited sample size, albeit, but we didn't see him be good last year, right? He had every chance to take over as the alpha, and he didn't. So the unknown always gets people excited, and that's what I think we have with Michael Pittman. None of his efficiency metrics told us that he was good last year. So the opportunity could be very high for him this year, but we haven't seen him be good. That is, that is the end of the story when it comes to Michael Pittman. That is the end of the story time for today's video. Again, if you enjoyed, make sure you subscribe to the channel. We're so close to 50,000 subscribers, and I love every single 49,777 of you guys. For real, from the bottom of my fucking black heart. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed. We'll be bike tomorrow with I forget what the video is, but, but we'll be here. We show up day in, day out. And I love y'all. Peace.